Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're talking about the work of organizations that commemorate and educate on the Holocaust. Our guests today are Aaron Blankenship, Interim Executive Director of the Florida Holocaust Museum in St. Petersburg, Florida, and Mary Pat Higgins, President and CEO of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. So I'd like to thank you all um, for joining us today. Today is the UN designated um, Holocaust uh, Remembrance Day. It was, it was designated as such uh, 17 years ago in 2005 as a way to promulgate memory so that these types of atrocities, this sort of human organized killing of other humans um, never happens again. And, uh, and that anniversary um, is linked to the liberation of auschwitz birkenau that extermination factory on January 27th, 1945. So let's talk about why it is important to retell this story, this story of tragedy, this story of death, this story that makes any human being uncomfortable. It happened 77 years ago. Why should people today learn about how over 6 million Jews and perhaps 11 million others were systematically murdered in Central Europe. And, and let's start off with, with, uh, with you, Aaron. Why is this important that Floridians are, and young people, older people, everyone, people who are not Jewish, learn about Auschwitz, learn about what happened in those times? Why is that important? Well, obviously, um... Education is a huge part of the mission of the Florida Holocaust Museum. And, you know, we feel it's important because um, I think you can't avoid, um, you know, the reports in the news about uh, contemporary anti-Semitism. Just last year, the our museum was a victim of a hate crime when um, vandals spray painted swastikas on the side of our building. Um, so we know that there's a rise in anti-Semitism. There's a rise of hate. You can't stay away from it in the news. And then of course, genocide persists. We are still, we still have um, genocides going on today. And, you know, unfortunately we haven't learned the lessons. So, you know, the mission of our museum, the mission of uh, Mary Pat's museum are more important than ever. And that co- that is uh, providing education in our school systems, providing education to our adult learners and um, the visitors who come through our doors. Is there is there an equivalence between that tragic and extreme example of cultural genocide um, and human genocide? And what is going on today, uh, Mary Pat? That that makes it important that people be informed by our past so that we don't repeat it in the future? Well, I think we view the Holocaust as the paradigm of genocide. Uh, For many reasons, it's unique. It's the only time that every man, woman, and child of a particular group was slated to be annihilated, regardless of if they identified with being in that group. You know, Jews who had converted or didn't even realize their family's history um, were considered Jews and were slated to be murdered throughout the world. So that makes it unique. Um, But we at the museum, at the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum, link the history of the Holocaust to the history of other genocides. We teach about the process of genocide because as Erin said, it is ongoing and in multiple places throughout the world today. And we want our visitors to be alert to the warning signs And when you learn those warning signs, you learn that polarization, that dehumanization, you know, are are two of the stages of genocide. And we see that in our world today. Now, just having dehumanization doesn't mean there will be genocide, but you can't have genocide without it. And so it's important that we understand those stages and that we stand up to those very negative um, processes in our society today. So let's talk about that. We're going to stay with you, with you, Mary Pat. Let's talk about the process that leads to genocide, because genocide is not a light switch. That's it, right. doesn't, it, it doesn't just flip on. There is a uh, fairly long lead time that is required, and people have to, and this is kind of a, a little bit like a gaslighting kind of thing, where you're, 
your your behaviors are being shifted, your perceptions are being shifted in advance of each stage. So could you just break down the process of genocide? Uh, sure, uh, I'm happy to. Yeah, so in our museum, we have a gallery that focuses on the 10 stages of genocide, and that's based on the scholarship of Greg Stanton, who founded Genocide Watch. And if you haven't um, visited that website, I encourage you to do that. Dr. Stanton, you know, is brilliant. And he went to Rwanda and Cambodia in the wake of their genocides and studied them. And he realized, you know, structurally that every genocide has these 10 elements. They don't always happen sequentially. And you can, you know, they don't often, I mean, oftentimes they're happening, multiple of the stages are happening at once, but they're always there. So it's, you know, it starts with classification, breaking into people people into groups, it moves on to symbolization where it's easy to identify them. Um, in our gallery for each of these stages, we teach about another historic genocide, but we remind people what that stage was in the Holocaust. So for symbolization, we all know the yellow star made it easy to identify Jews. Um, well, and break them and put it in modern uh, parlance, right? The first thing is you categorize people right, right into different groups. And Make it easy civilization, to identify. Civilization is creating a brand for them and imposing that brand on them. Right. Then you start to treat them differently, through, and that's discrimination. Right. Um, oftentimes, legally, you know, think about um, Jim Crow laws in in the United States were legal discrimination. Then you move on to dehumanization. It's much easier to to hurt someone, to even murder someone if you view them as less than human. So in the Rwandan genocide, the Hutus called the Tutsis cockroaches, right? It's easier to, to think about killing someone if, when you think they're less than you. It moves on to preparation, to um, polarization. Polarization, polarization, preparation, persecution, Pers discrimination, and then denial. So Always denial at we, the end. We see, when we look at the Holocaust, the extermination piece. Right. That's at the tail end, right, Erin? I mean, you, you get this whole idea. And, and in your museum, do you, do you also uh, describe how, for example, media was used to brand people, to create these ideas that discrimination was okay in a otherwise really embracing society, but you're, you're shifting this is this is purposeful. You're shifting that society to embrace these these uh, these differences. Do you also uh, talk about that in your? Uh, in your yes, history? absolutely. Our permanent exhibition, you know, teaches the history of the Holocaust, all of the stages that led to it, and and just like Mary Pat said, you know, usually this type of discrimination and persecution, when it comes to genocide, is legal. You know, these were laws that were set up to separate um, Jewish citizens. So, you know, we teach, we teach all of the stages because people don't realize sometimes the insidiousness of um, anti-Semitism even today. And it helps us to show, you know, this, this is how what's going on today kind of aligns with what happened during the Holocaust. Um, you know, our exhibition use, you know, and I'm sure I haven't visited uh, Mary Pass Museum. I hope to do so soon, but I'm sure it's it's similar there where we use um, individual stories where they talk about um, being singled out, losing their rights, having to leave their jobs. Um, and those individual stories are really the, what makes a difference when we talk about the Holocaust and when we talk about genocide. So, and, and it's pervasive, right? You end up with um, an impact on uh, the political body politic, the media uh, <laughs> uh, uh, landscape, the business landscape, right? Um, how people can move through society. Um, let's talk a little bit about a pre-genocidal uh, structure because we, we so often focus on the factories of death once they're built. How do we get to the point where these factories are built but not inhabited yet? How do we get to that point? Because there is there's funding that's required, which means that financial institutions are required to generate the capital 
you have uh, construction companies. We all work for those companies. We all work for those banks. We all are part and parcel of the media landscape. This program is a part and parcel of a media landscape. How do we today think about our small role when we buy cotton from slave labor camps that happen to be in a different country? Um, how do we think today about our small role, which cumulatively can become a big role in promulgating these types of, of, of pre-behaviors that we're talking about here that might never uh, gel into such an extreme example, but are also damaging to our fellow humans? All right, Pat, uh, how, do, how do I think about that? It's, it's a great question. Well, in a, in a global society, you know, I think we are at, we may be unwittingly or maybe knowingly contributing to, you know, that the mechanism, the organization of genocide, buying products, you know, from that are made by forced labor from the Uyghurs in China would be an example of that. Um, you know, we, when you, when you think about genocide and particularly the study of the Holocaust, Every element of society joined in to execute the Holocaust. Law enforcement, you know, for gave up their oath to protect the public and and started persecuting individuals of the public. Doctors turned in their patients who were physically and mentally disabled for um, systematic murder. So um, lawyers, judges, all of these elements that we think of as being safeguards in our society. The state where everybody is encouraged to, to tell on each other mm -hmm. uh, and, and report That's it. Right. That's, right. That's right. So I think too, you know, this concept of, we really focus, Mark, on the, on behavior and it, people's individual choices and the difference they make. We use a term called upstander. I think, Erin, y'all, you use that. We too. absolutely do. Mm -hmm. um, and so we define that as someone who sees something wrong and works to make it right, stands up for them, the, their rights and the rights of others, and fights unfair, unfairness, injustice, and inequality. You know, there's a tendency to think about only the perpetrators and to blame them, but the vast majority of the people that played a role in the Holocaust were bystanders that saw what was happening and did nothing. And so I think that's the risk for all of us to be bystanders. And so our goal through education is to help people think about the role that they play and can play in standing up to injustice and to stopping it. So we're all empowered. It's just a matter of us being conscious about what we can do, those small acts. Can, can we right. talk a little bit about- And giving people the tools to, to feel like they can do those things. Yeah, I, so so Aaron, that's that, that's a great segue into that, that topic that I want to talk about. I want to, I want to talk about the topic of discomfort and the interaction of discomfort and knowledge, uncomfortable knowledge, yeah. and, and how that might equip us. Um, we just, uh, um, uh, it was just reported that in, a school district in Tennessee, uh, they banned the teaching of, of the graphic novel Mouse, is a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, novel describing the author's uh, family's experience um, within the concentration camps and, and their ultimate uh, death of most of that, uh, of that family. Uh, it's very accessible. It's taught to children because graphic, uh, graphic novels uh, mm -hmm. with cartoon characters create a sufficient distance. But that's been banned now, and and we're there's this big discussion about banning uncomfortable topics, uh, banning uh, discussion of the Trail of Tears because uh, that where Native Americans uh, suffered so uh, horrendously, uh, particular tribes suffered so horrendously during that um, that uh, era, or the internment of Japanese during uh, World War II in the United States. Right. Uh, is it important? to teach uncomfortable uh, topics, or do we shy away and wait until it's quote age appropriate? I, I don't really know what the answer is because there are certain lessons that you wouldn't necessarily want to expose to a very young child. How do you navigate that, Aaron? How do you, how do you deal with that issue? Well the, well, the Holocaust is an uncomfortable subject. The murder of 6 million innocent people, including um, a million and a half children is uncomfortable history. So um, we don't shy away from it. Um, now, of course, there's 
concepts within the history of the Holocaust that are difficult for understanding when we think about those younger ages. And so we have to still teach this, the subject um, with uh, concepts, concepts, excuse me, that are understandable for the appropriate age group. Um, but we can't, you know, it's our mission to teach this history. We can't shy away from it. And, um, and you know, like I said before, it's more important than ever that we feel um, you know, uh, empowered to, to speak up, to teach this history. Um, and that's how, that's the reason why we are in um, so many of the counties in Florida in the, in the public and private schools to give them primary sources, materials that they can use that are approachable for their students to, to um, allow the, the students to feel empowered to speak up when they see somebody, um, you know, or hear somebody saying something that's racist or, um, you know, to speak out against injustice. These are these stories that we um, share of our survivors, of their families, um, and when we share the history, these are tools that can be used to talk about concepts going on today. Mayor Pat, I'm gonna to come to you in a second, but we just finished a, a uh, poll in which we asked why teach about the Holocaust, what are the most important reasons for teaching about the Holocaust? And we asked people to pick uh, uh, several. The top answers were it, under, it underlines that genocide is a process that can be challenged. Um, another area can illustrate the roles of historic, historical, social, religious, political, and economic factors. Um, and the third uh, area, uh, slightly less than the other two that got a lot of votes, were uh, it demonstrates the fragility of all societies. In other words, if we don't act, then uh, we are making our own uh, society uh, more fragile. Um, can, can, can you comment uh, further on, on how we bring this across? Because in today's media landscape, it seems that fact and history and simple statement whether true or untrue, have an equivalence that is just astounding, right? You could say something based in fact, and you can just assert through social media something that has that is totally fantastical, and it's accepted as equal, as equivalent. Right. Well, you know, I, I think, you know, tech, social media can be used for good, but it also is a, is a source of misinformation and radicalization and can be very dangerous. And if, um, you know, and, and for parents, we urge our parents to, to engage and, and help their children think of, you know, really look at the social media that they are using. And um, clearly media, media literacy is a very important topic right now. Um, you know, it's we're in a dangerous time where um, even in, in Texas, there was a law passed that I think was originally meant to to confront the teaching of critical race theory, which we know is is not in curriculum for primary, secondary students really anywhere. But that that says that teachers cannot be forced to teach curriculum that is controversial or that might make someone feel uncomfortable and that they also shouldn't be making uh, teaching something that would make people feel guilty um, for, you know, the sins of their ancestors, which, um, you know, would really, frankly, rule out most history. Um, <laughs> so there's always an aggressor, you know, so there's always someone that, that might feel guilty. Um, and so I, I think that's just a very, very dangerous trend that you know, of course, we need to be teaching factual content, but we know that the final stage of, of genocide is denial. And there are people that deny the Holocaust, even though it's the most well-documented genocide. And so we can't let those, that fringe group of people that deny factual evidence keep us from teaching that history to students. And I think that applies to all history. So do you mean to say that if I were a teacher and I were to um, to uh, teach in, in a history uh, class uh, on Texas, that the uh, last uh, mob lynching uh, in Texas occurred in Eastland, Texas, and that made my students uncomfortable. And I can't imagine a person on this earth who would not be uncomfortable with that fact. Am right. I not allowed to teach that? Well, the, it's a very murky law, Mark. It's, it's, it's 
somewhat vague and it's left up to the interpretation of parents, of school districts, and of teachers. It doesn't specify what's uncomfortable and what's not. And I think that's, you know, I, I wouldn't like the law more if it specified it, I have to admit. But I think that's part of what the problem is, is that it is left up to interpretation. So absolutely, a teacher might teach that history and a child might go home and tell their parents about it and that they felt guilty that their you know, family lived in that community. And the result could be that the school board would say that that history couldn't be taught. Is this sort of ambiguity a technique that is that is used a more modern technique? I mean, we're seeing the the idea of ambiguous laws applied in places like Hong Kong, where people are being swept up and and um, and arrested and and imprisoned for speech that is viewed as being anti Chinese or anti government, right. whatever. Right. Is the, amb- is the amb- ambiguity now kind of a, a modern uh, 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 way to create so much uncertainty that people sort of self-edit, basically saying, you know, who knows what might happen to you if you say something? You know, I, I think that's a great question. And I hadn't really thought of it that broadly, but I think you're right. Um, it, it makes people more cautious and it makes them more less likely to speak up. And there was a, you know, a very, you know, famous episode in Texas in a South Lake School District about six months ago in response to this new law where an administrator brought up the Holocaust as a potentially controversial topic. Now, I've met with that administrator. She believes in the history of the Holocaust. She thinks it should be taught. But she said to me that every year when they are teaching night, Ellie Wiesel's night, she has parents contact her to say that they object to their, their children reading that book because they don't believe in the history of the Holocaust. So this handful of parents objecting raised this, the specter of this being a controversial topic. And that's why she gave the Holocaust as an example. Um, and so I, I do think the ambiguity leaves it open to interpretation and it puts fear into people that whatever they do might be wrong. So they stick to, um, you know, a very narrow um, path. You know, I, I find this so interesting, the idea of facts. Uh, we just had this situation where Neil Young asked Spotify to take um, his music down if uh, they continued to allow people who spread disinformation on, on um, the, the, uh, 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 on COVID. Um, and Spotify made a, a, a choice which was commercially um, logical. It basically said, we're not going to, um, we're not going to moderate uh, that content. Uh, Eric, do you think that there is a, a requirement and I got this from the head of the Jewish Museum in Frankfurt, where, where she basically said, you Americans taught us in the aftermath of the Second World War that all speech, while it should be free, is not on an equivalent uh, playing field in, in terms of freedom. In other words, advocate, advocacy of, of restricting speech is not the same as advocacy of speech. Do you believe, Erin, that there is some, some way that, that we should function that doesn't restrict our freedom of expression, but also points to fact versus, um, versus non-fact? So if somebody is deny, denying the Holocaust, is that equivalent as somebody who talks about the Holocaust? Well, I would certainly argue it's not equivalent because the Holocaust was a factual event. And what should media that, companies do about this? I mean, well, we, yes. you, I think um, a couple of years, um, and Mary Pat can, Mary Pat can probably uh, correct me, but you know, it was just last year or the year before when a number of organizations got together and, um, um, you know, spoke out against uh, Facebook allowing Holocaust denial on on their platform. Um, and so, you know, I think we all have a responsibility to to speak out in in an organized fashion like we did um, or or, you know, writing to our Congress people about um, things like this going on. So so it's it's certainly not equivalent. Um, and I think that um, platforms like 
Facebook or other social media platforms do have a responsibility. They're not, um, you know, they're, they're, um, because social media can be a very dangerous place that spreads hatred um, like this, they have a responsibility to combat it and to, um, and to, to, you know, ban those types of postings, those types of groups, um, because not only do people post that sort of material, those sorts of comments, but it's also a place where people organize and, and um, the results can be tragic as we've seen. So, Mayor Pat, do you believe that there should be some sort of constraint on how people are allowed to use these these uh, social media platforms by the companies themselves or by uh, outside regulation? It's a very tricky topic. It, It really is. It's such a slippery slope. But I, you know, I think everyone, you know, we grew up thinking about freedom of speech, saying it's not okay to scream fire in a movie theater. (laughs) <laughs> right. And and I think, you know, we need to that equivalent. I mean, we need to think about that. It's 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 not OK to say <laughs> that that, you know, the vaccine that we are being implanted with a, some sort of monitor in the vaccine and to spread that on social media. So, you know, I do believe I, there needs to be a carefully thought through there needs there need to be limits. I think the social media companies that are not, um, you know, it's not a public broadcasting system. They are corporate, you know, going concerns. Yes. They're focused on the bottom line, but I think they have a responsibility to monitor their traffic and to, um, to not give access to people that are spreading misinformation and who are spewing hatred and organizing. As Aaron said, you know, using it as a platform to rally people and grow a movement. I think that they have a responsibility to guard against that. Well, if we go, if we go back and we just completed a poll uh, in which we talked about using the Holocaust as a touch point, should Holocaust museums focus on, we asked the experience of Jews, the full picture of state-sponsored genocide during that particular era or, or beyond that era, and then all of the above. And the vast majority said, um, either all of the above or sort of uh, broader than, than just the impact on, on the Jewish people. Sure. Um, we're going to, we're coming to the end of our time. So I'd like you each to, to have a final word. We'll start with Aaron and then uh, go to Mary Pat. One of the issues that, that I, uh, I see in, if you look at uh, genocide watches, 10 stages of, of, of uh, genocide, classification, symbolization, discrimination, dehumanization, organization, polarization, preparation, persecution, extermination, denial. Extermination is the, is the piece that we all see. Everything else is, is communication and workflow. And what is our media landscape today? Our media landscape is communication and workflow, whether it's classification, symbolization. That's right all these different, all the way through to denial. So the question is, is that if there is a link here between what has happened in the past and what could happen in the future, and if that link is part of what you're teaching, the question that I'm going to ask you is our exiting question, what should I do today and tomorrow? What should my children do? What should my friends do? What should Americans do of all stripes in order to ensure that something like this is actively combated on a day-to-day basis in little ways. Erin, could you give, give uh, your That's take? an excellent question. We get that a lot. And that's, that's the whole reason that we're here. So, um, you know, at the Florida Holocaust Museum, you know, we provide all of these resources for teachers, tra- training them on how to teach the Holocaust and also, you know, teaching students the lessons of the Holocaust. And the importance of that is to give them the material that they need to stand up, to speak out. So we encourage people to do that. We encourage people to write um, their congressmen and women. Um, And um, I would also say that parents need to advocate for Holocaust education in their school systems. Um, And, you know, that's at the state level here in Florida, we have a mandate um, that, that um, tells 
every teacher in Florida that this needs to be taught in the schools. And so, so uh, you know, there's far too few uh, states that have this mandate. So teachers, or I'm sorry, teachers and parents need to advocate for that. And, um, you know, in little ways in your communities, people need to speak out individually, person to person. If you see something, say something. You know, you, you hear somebody saying something wrong to another person based on the color of their skin, based on a difference, then you speak out against it. Um, it's the same, you know, same with other types of injustices. These are the little ways that individuals can make extraordinary differences. And we really believe that and teach it. And Mary Pat, Texas is such a vast state, you know, the Dallas and Houston uh, region, you have uh, Austin, you have the, the border areas, the panhandle of Texas, all of which we've served, we've worked in, we have friends there. Um, how do we function in these large and small ways to make the lessons of the Holocaust resonate today and, and enacted today uh, to make America better? Well, our, um, as, as with Aaron's Museum, our goal in teaching the history of the Holocaust and other genocides as, as well at, at our museum as the evolution of civil and human rights in our own country is to um, help people understand the impact that individuals had mm -hmm. um, and points that were critical when people could have stood up and, and stopped something from happening. So our goal is to impact behavior today and to help people understand, you know, they, they, might not under, they might not see the ripple effect of the actions that they take today on others, but that their actions are critically important. We end our exhibit with a call to action, encouraging people to get engaged as a volunteer in our community. You know, thinking about trying to stop genocide is a little overwhelming, but thinking about how you can get engaged with your community and be a positive force, care about others, step outside of yourself and do things to make a difference in your community is much easier. And I think it starts with that. But, um, you know, we need to be, we need to understand that if we stand by and don't speak out when anti-Semitism is, you know, on the rise, when, when our society is more polarized than ever, if we don't speak out and try to be part of the solution, then we are part of the problem. That's and, right. and that's our primary goal. And that's, that's, that's my takeaway uh, from, from the wisdom that you're sharing with us today, that, that it's the little things that I communicate, the things that I pass on or retweet or, or uh, the little ways in which I treat people who are different than me, right? The, the small behaviors is really where it all starts. That's right. And so by shifting my behaviors in little ways, I might be doing my small bit to, to spread in a viral way some resistance to, to uh, this disease of hate. Erin Blankenship, the Interim Executive Director of the Florida Holocaust Museum in St. Petersburg, and Mary Pat Higgins, President CEO of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. Thank you so much for sharing the knowledge that is embedded within your institutions. Please thank your staffs, thank your boards, Thank your communities. You have really, really helped us to understand just a little bit more about the relevance of this uh, heinous act of 70, 70 years ago and how we can become resilient uh, in the fight against such, such thinking and such behavior. Thank you Thanks so much for having us.